says Michael Popak. And by the looks of things, it must be Legal AF after dark. We got to return to Mar-a-Lago and federal judge Aileen Cannon, who on paper and the headlines read, she dealt Donald Trump a blow because she refused to dismiss the indictment for Espionage Act and obstruction of justice for his stealing and keeping top secret classified national defense information when he left office because she refused his motion to dismiss on presidential records grounds. But when you get deeper, take a deeper dive, look under the hood of the order, we got trouble. And uh, it could, based on her analysis of how the jury instructions may work, could lead to Donald Trump getting a acquittal he's not entitled to, and uh, the prosecutors not being able to do a thing about it, including on appeal. We want to avoid that. Is it now time for Jack Smith to take uh, Cannon up on appeal to the 11th Circuit and seek her reassignment? We debate it on Legal AF. Take a listen. Let's pivot right now and talk about, you know, a hanky-like figure, um, a Trumpian-like figure, uh, a federal Judge Cannon, who was appointed by Donald Trump and appointed during the period where Trump was a lame duck, um, although he's always been a kind of fraudulent lame duck his entire life and perhaps far worse than that. But she's been the worst judge ever. And, and nothing that she says e even looks like the law. She, you know, it would be like Judge Eileen, Can it would be like uh, Alina Haba becoming uh, a judge is almost like what Judge Eileen Cannon is. And, you know, we've tried, in you know, Popak, you've tried more than me to early on give Judge Cannon the benefit of the doubt of things. But, you know, uh, she ends up kind of making a, a fool of you and me when you start seeing these orders and, and, and everybody out there. You know, the headline about this recent order that Judge Cannon makes is you'd be like, hide the ketchup. Donald Trump's pissed. Did Judge Cannon turn against uh, Donald Trump? She ruled that the motion to dismiss that Trump filed under the Presidential Records Act is denied. So isn't that a big win? Not really, because it's the stupidest argument ever. It's 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 a borderline treasonous argument. It's 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 arguing that uh, that that Trump under a civil statute, the Presidential Records Act, which deals with stopping people like Trumpian figures from claiming things as their personal property on a civil statute, that that somehow preempts our criminal law so that if he's willfully retaining national defense information, the PRA, the Presidential Records Act, trumps no pun intended, our, you know, his committing crimes such that a judge and a jury cannot even question the categorization of things as personal. And so the Presidential Records Act says, look, these types of things are presidential records. These types of things is, are personal because what it was trying to do was create some clarity for presidents on their way out. Like, OK, you know, like your notes may actually still be presidential. If they relate to like an autobiography or something personal, then they're personal. It, it never said that a, a president could claim our nuclear codes and things that are clearly classified records and national defense information as their personal property. It's the dumbest argument ever. It, it, it's so dumb that if you were to make this argument in a national security law school class, like you would flunk it on the first day and the, and the professor would say, what are you talking about? And the students would start laughing because it's the stupidest concept ever. You can't claim nuclear codes as personal property because you just said so and put it in boxes and shipped it to Mar-a-Lago. You can't telepathically declassify records just because you there's a there's process, there's a law. This is the United States of America, damn it. So the fact that Judge Cannon denied his motion to dismiss under the Presidential Records Act, that's like the bare minimum. But remember what Judge Cannon did before that. And this was also a development this week where Judge Cannon had previously requested that special counsel Jack Smith engage with, those were her words, engage with two different types of hypothetical factual scenarios. And based on these factual scenarios, provide jury instructions regarding the interplay between the Presidential Records Act 
and the uh, Espionage Act. Remember that? And both of those hypothetical scenarios that you wanted Jack Smith to engage with. By the way, what are you doing that you, as a judge, you, you don't ask the parties to engage with things. You make orders. You grant a motion or you deny a motion. That's what you do as a judge. This isn't like a, a like a game. You're not a game show host. Like what in the world are you are you even doing? So Jack Smith, Michael Popak did exactly word for word almost what you and I predicted he would do. He said, I'm not going to engage with unlawful scenarios. The premise of both are false. The Presidential Records Act has nothing to do with criminal law and the Espionage Act. But Judge Cannon, let me submit for you the instructions that have always been used for like 100 years in cases involving the Espionage Act, because this isn't a new statute. We have the model jury instructions. Here are the jury instructions you should use, which are the same instructions that courts use across the country in any case involving the Espionage Act. But Jack Smith also said, Judge Cannon, if you really believe, though, like like you are essentially implying here that the Presidential Records Act plays a factor in these jury instructions at all, let us know now because we'll either seek an appeal or we will seek a writ of mandate or a mandamus. We will go directly to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal and order you to comply with the law because you clearly have a misconception of the law. And Jack Smith put it in slightly nicer words than that, but he, he, was, he was elegant with it. So what did Judge Cannon do? I think she realized that she was trapped. So she denied Donald Trump's motion to dismiss under the Presidential Records Act. But she stated, she goes, separately, to the extent the special counsel demands an anticipatory finalization of jury instructions prior to trial, prior to a charge conference, and prior to presentation of trial defenses, the court declines the demand as unprecedented and unjust. So Judge Cannon saying, I'm not going to tell you if I believe the Presidential Records Act should be part of the eventual jury instructions. She goes, I find that to be unjust. And then in her order uh, denying Donald Trump's motion to dismiss, she goes, for these reasons, accepting the allegations of the superseding indictment as true, the Presidential Records Act does not provide a pretrial basis to dismiss under Rule 12B, which is a federal rule to dismiss. But notice what she says there. She says, does not provide a pretrial. She puts those words very intentionally and specifically in there. It's not that it doesn't provide a pretrial basis. It's that it provides no basis at all. She's putting those words in there to hint at that she would dismiss this case while the trial is taking place. Otherwise, you don't need to put the words in there, um, pre-trial basis only. So now the question is, and I'll, I'll toss it to you, Popak, but just so our viewers and audio listeners go, Ben, you hog the whole topic. Don't worry. When we get to Manhattan District Attorney, Popak's going to handle that whole topic. Everybody knows that I'm a geek when it comes to SEPA, <laughs> Classified Information Protection Act, Procedures Act. Presidential Records Act stuff. So here's what I think, Judge. Here's what I think Special Counsel Jack Smith does. He won the motion, so there's nothing to appeal. He can't appeal the win. It's not the way it works. So I think what he does, though, is he will wait until the motion in limines, the pretrial motions. He will file one to exclude any reference to the PRA. If she does not make a ruling on that, he's now built his record. He will then go to the 11th Circuit, then... We'll see what the 11th Circuit does. Now, I think the one thing I, that Jack Smith has as an insurance pocket, though, as an insurance policy, since we're talking about insurance, in his back pocket, people have been wondering why hasn't Jack Smith done anything with Bedminster and charged in New Jersey federal court? He still is within the statute to file against Donald Trump there. I think that he's thinking that if... After all of these things, the 11th Circuit doesn't step in eventually, which I think they're going to. Jack Smith just has to be, unfortunately, patient with the timing so he doesn't screw himself with the games that Cannon's playing. I think Jack Smith goes, if after all of this, Cannon does something egregious and a jury's impaneled 
and then Canon dismisses it. So Jeopardy attaches and then there can't be a, an appeal and the case is fully dismissed. I think he says, well, then I have I have my New Jersey case. Trump did this in other states as well. And, and I'll go there anyway. That's my thinking about his fi- Jack Smith's final move. If after all of this, Canon kind of gets away with it. Yeah. Here's my respectful it's not disagreement because you and I usually see eye to eye on things, but you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fun and energy and juice when we can disagree a bit. I'm not sure he has to wait until, um, because he quote unquote won the motion. I'm not sure he won the motion. The problem with the way that the motion is written, as you've outlined for judge Cannon is the headline we've talked about and you got into the, the details of it. Um, it is a motion to dismiss the indictment at the indictment stage on the presidential records act is uh, denied because the President's Records Act isn't mentioned in the indictment and I have to accept everything is true and there hasn't been briefing on the issue, but I'm going to allow, as you said, I'm going to allow you to raise it again at trial. And the problem with that is that, it, that even as written, it demonstrates that the judge is in the throes of a stalemate or a painting herself into the corner of her own making that you now have a on paper, an indication or a memorialization that can go up to her boss, the 11th Circuit, that she has gotten off on the wrong foot about how to analyze these various laws and whether they intersect at all, which they don't. There's no Venn diagram in a proper world, in a non-alien canon world, where the Presidential Records Act intersects with the Espionage Act or the Obstruction of Justice Act to serve as a defense or as an element of the crime. And you have now her indicating that she's doubling down on her wrongheaded thinking, which infects all of her other decisions, and that she's created, as I said, this sort of stalemate environment. And there's a set of factors, I've done a hot take on it, in Florida, the case is called Torkington. There's three, there's three specific factors. And I think we're at the point where, and, I, and I'm sure that uh, Jack Smith is evaluating it, whether he can hold up this piece of paper Align with all the other things that she's done wrong in the case from day one. In fact, we, we don't do shows about what she's done right in the case because we'd have no show to do. She's done everything wrong. And when she does it wrong and makes an error, it's always in favor of Donald Trump. It's never in favor of the prosecutor. And what he has to worry about, what we worry about, is this concept of double jeopardy, which we will cover at length, you and me, in Patreon because it's a long topic. But I'll give it to you the short way. If through, even through error, if instructions, for instance, are given to a jury that improperly instructs them on the law, right, and gives them jury instructions that make it harder or almost impossible for the prosecution to win their case because it's added on elements that shouldn't be there, as you said, that don't belong in a model jury instruction on this thing, and the jury acquits and jeopardy is attached, uh, and he's, he's, he's acquitted. Uh, it's very difficult, if not impossible, even uh, even with an appeal, if you will, to uh, retry Donald Trump. He walks. And that is the fear that, that she is not just um, not competent or just inexperienced, which is what I gave her the credit for in the very beginning. And we're going to talk about two judges today. The next segment is going to be about another inexperienced judge and what he might be doing wrong again. Both of these judges are less than a year uh, under their belt as judges ever when they got their respective Trump cases. Um, and I know people around the world are saying, that's how you guys administer justice. You take the least experienced judge and give him the most monumental uh, and historic of cases. <laughs> yes, if that's the random assignment process. Um, but sh- that's what he's got to worry about. And if he can now pull together that this judge is is vi- it, it, under the Torkington factors, it's now time. We don't have to wait to see that she is speeding at 100 miles an hour down a road where the bridge is out ahead. We don't have to wait for her to go over the bridge and take justice with her. Uh, we, can, we can stop it now and get a proper judge because every time, Ben, it just shows that her th- mental process is infected improperly with uh, a position that she's taking and doubling and tripling down on and digging her heels in on. And you see it in the writing. And I'm sure they'll circle it when they send this in to the, if they do this, to the 11th Circuit, where she's, as you said, she's dared them to take her up on appeal. 
She didn't have to say that at the end. Everybody knows that people have the right to bring appeals on things uh, with merit that they they need. But she was reacting to the, her their criticism, calling her out and saying, your homework assignment about the jury instructions and telling us to both assume two scenarios, we can sort of live with your second scenario because we feel we'll be able to prove that none of this information could possibly be personal in nature to Donald Trump. But the fact that you're putting us through that exercise because you think the Presidential Records Act somehow provides a defense shows clear error if that's the case by the court. Uh, and she said, no, no, it's not clear error. You've, Mr. Mr. Special Prosecutor, you have misstated my position. I was doing it as a thought experiment. I wanted to see the jury instructions well in advance of ever setting a jury uh, for trial. Now, just to see how the parties analyze the case law and the legal to, to guide me in decisions. The problem with that is, and the problem the 11th Circuit will have with that self-confession, is that the person wearing the black robe a year and a half into a trial, into a case, needs to understand at now, if not at the beginning of the case, the law and how it applies to the facts and the indictment and the defenses, not fumbling around in the dark, looking for the law and hoping that Trump's submissions help her. That is not her job right now. And she just confessed to me that she is she is right now at the moment when she should have understood this law a year ago. She is now just coming to a realization that she doesn't understand the law, and it's infecting every decision that she's making. If I'm Jack Smith, I say it's not. we're not appealing the ruling, but look at how she got there and look at what she has said. Use the Torkington factors, get rid of her, reassign her off this case, and bring in a judge that knows what they're doing so that we can do justice. That's me. You know, and that's, the hopium, know my- that's, the, that's the hopium papakian thing that you like to sell on the show. No, the Hopian, Papakian, smoking <laughs> thing is about the Washington, D.C. federal criminal case going. <laughs> but we'll talk about that in a bit. But um, but just so people know what, you know, the way Popak just characterized what Cannon said, let me just give you Cannon's exact words. The courts, this is from Judge Cannon's order. The court's order soliciting preliminary draft instructions on certain counts should not be misconstrued as declaring a final definition on any essential element or asserted defenses in this case, nor should it be interpreted as anything other than what it was. It was just my genuine attempt in the context of the upcoming trial to better understand the party's competing positions and the questions to be submitted to the jury in this complex case of the first impression. As always, any party remains free to avail itself of whatever appellate options it sees fit to invoke as permitted by law. The ultimate gaslighting. Look, and again, this is what I say. This isn't a Democrat or a Republican thing. You don't want people like Judge Eileen Cannon or Alina Haba or Laura Loomer or Matt Gates or James Comer or Jim Jordan, who's like, the thing about it this way, Jim Jordan, who runs the Judiciary Committee, is not a licensed lawyer. Not a licensed lawyer runs the Judiciary Committee in that he went to a law school, never took the bar exam. I know a lot of people who were still smart and passed the bar exam, but I don't think you need to be on the Judiciary Committee. I don't think I want a licensed lawyer on the Judiciary Committee the same way I want like a brain surgeon to be doing the brain surgery. I mean, I don't think that's a significant ask, but this is the MAGA crew, and this is why this is the intersection of law and politics. Welcome back. Well, that was Legal AF. And we do that twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Join us on this YouTube channel uh, for the Midas Touch Network. Uh, It's the only place that we do it. It's exclusively there. And you'll find out why we call it Legal AF. We curate and cultivate the best five legal stories or so at the intersection of law and politics. And we bring it to you just like that. That was with me and Ben Micellis. On Wednesdays, it's with me and Karen Freeman Ignifilo. And then the leaders of Legal AF do hot takes just like this one on a regular basis, hourly even, on the Midas Touch Network. Help 
get the Midas Touch Network up to 3 million free subscribers. Go back out and hit the free subscribe button. Yes, I said free. If you know all about Legal AF, we really thank you for being part of our audience. Take that clip, send it off to friends and family and others in your life and see if you can get them to join us. Uh, other than that, this is Michael Popak reporting. Until my next hot take, until my next Legal AF. Heary, heary, Legal AF Law Breakdown is now in session. Go beyond the headlines and get a deep dive into the important legal concepts you need to know and we discuss every day on Legal AF. Exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, all for the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Join us at patreon.com slash legal AF. That's patreon.com slash legal AF.